It's 2014, Larian released their first critical acclaimed game, Divinity Original Sin. Following the game's release, Swan Vinky met with the Wizards of the Coast, the publishers of Dungeons and Dragons, to pitch his vision of Baldur's Gate 3. I'd like to license Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> After the meeting, he receives a rejection. 2023. Nine years later, Baldur's Gate is winning every single possible award it could win. Swan marches from one event to another in his night suit, smashing all competitions out of the gate. Meanwhile, Bioware, the studio that originally made it Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, is facing over 50 layoffs, including the original writer of Dragon Age series, while their next big release, Dragon Age Redwall, experiences another delay. How did it happen that Larian, a once small studio founded almost at the same time as Bioware, have been on the verge of bankruptcy more than 10 times, is now winning every single award, while Bioware, a legendary studio which had enjoyed success throughout his entire history, hasn't produced a great game in years. I believe that Baldur's Gate 3 is probably the greatest CRPG to have come out in a decade. They created a game on a scale that only Bioware could achieve during their golden age, but they didn't merely adopt their formula and created an old Bioware-like experience, they made it better. How did it happened that we haven't seen any more great CRPGs from Bioware? And how did Larian manage to become this RPG powerhouse? Let's look at both studios' history and try to find answers in their past. This is your end! Bioware was formed in Edmonton, Canada. It's 1994. Trent Oster, one of the founders of Bioware, had just finished his third year of computer science. His older brother and his best high school friend, Marcel Zeschuk, challenged themselves to make a game over the summer. They decided that if they could do that, they would be able to justify quitting their jobs to focus on making games full-time. They managed to create their first game, Blasteroid 3D, which according to Trend is pretty awful and it's okay that we never heard about it. Greg Zeschuk used to visit every summer during which they played Dungeons and Dragons together. When he heard about game development, he wanted to get involved. He brought along two fellow doctors, Ray Muzika and Augustin Yip. Together, they became the six original founders of Bioware in February 1995. The six founders pulled together $100,000 to make their first game. With three of them being successful doctors, they were able to afford the resources needed to start development. Together, they created a demo for their first game, Shattered Steel. After sending it to 10 different publishers, seven replied that they wanted to get on board, and they signed a deal with Interplay. It did okay sales-wise, and Interplay wanted them to make a sequel. However, somewhere during the development, the sequel got cancelled. After Shattered still Bioware loses Augustin Yip, first founder to leave Bioware. With the funds from the moderate success of Shattered Steel, Bioware created the Infinity Engine. They made a brief demo using this engine to pitch a new game, Baldur's Gate, to interplay. Baldur's Gate was supposed to be a Dungeon and Dragons game made on the Infinity Engine. Bioware somehow managed to acquire a D&D license beforehand. Interplay liked what they saw and agreed to finance the game. Before releasing the new game, Interplay Entertainment forecasted the game's commercial success as extremely low. At that time, the Western RPG genre was considered dead. Interplay predicted zero sales in Germany and no more than 50,000 lifetime sales in England. However, the game became an expected commercial hit, selling over 2.8 million copies worldwide to this day. Does it remind you the commercial forecast for Baldur's Gate 3? Even on Microsoft Leaks, they estimated that 5 million will be enough to bring it to the Game Pass. While just from the sales, Baldur's Gate grossed over 236.6 million just on Steam, seems that they were quite underestimated. Dull your weapons as you wish. Back to Bioware. After the success of Baldur's Gate, Marcel Zeschuk left Bioware. Since then, Bioware has been on a roll. Pretty much any title has been an instant RPG classic. Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Anne, a greatly improved sequel of the first game, Neverwinter Nights, another Dungeons & Dragons game that featured a tool set for players to create their own adventures. I remember back then it was very popular, a lot of people used to make their own adventures and actually host their D&D sessions inside of the game. And then came the first ever Star Wars RPG, Star Wars The Knights of the Old Republic. It's arguably the best Star Wars game ever made. It sold over 250,000 units in just 4 days exclusively on Xbox. It is a massive number especially considering that those were Xbox early days. Probably one of the most successful Xbox exclusives ever. And then there was 2005's Jade Empire, Bioware's first original IP. The game received excellent reviews but didn't sell well enough for Bioware to pursue a sequel. They believe that they made a mistake by releasing the game in the final year of the Xbox generation and that they should have launched it as a title for the Xbox 360 from the start. After Jade Empire, a significant change occurred. In November 2005, a private equity firm Elevation Partners acquired Pandemic Studios and Bioware for 300 million. Initially, 
Both studios were supposed to maintain their branding and creative independence. However, in 2007, Electronic Arts purchased BioWare and Pandemic Studios from Elevation Partners for $860 million. BioWare became part of Electronic Arts, but retained its own branding. We will still get great games from BioWare. There were two titles that were still in development prior of the acquisition. First, 2007 Mass Effect and 2009 Dragon Age Origins. Dragon Age Origins, in my opinion, is BioWare's peak. It's the game that I played the most upon release. I remember playing when it came out. It was probably the first game that I completed multiple playthroughs in a row. I just wanted to explore every single possible outcome and every single character's origins. The characters, the companions, and the conversation in the camp, all of that felt fresh and new, unlike anything seen before. It felt like a significant leap in production quality from previous generation RPGs. And to be honest, I haven't seen anything like that ever since. After Dragon Age, Trent Oster and Brent Oster left Bioware. They left to found their own studio Beamdog. 2010, Mass Effect 2 was released. It received great reviews, it maintained the classic Bioware formula with dialogues and consequences and dynamic relationship with companions. It was also when I believe they started simplifying their RPG mechanics. I think that Mass Effect 2 started to become more of a third action shooter than an RPG. After Mass Effect 2, I believe each game started to be worse than the previous. The first stumble came with Dragon Age 2 had a very short development cycle, and it didn't feel like it could hold up the same quality as the first game. It felt rushed with repetitive combat and an overall undercooked feel. Most of the RPG mechanics were simplified, as they believed that by simplifying the combat and the gameplay, more people would enjoy the game. Dragon Age 2 was also pushed by upper management for a faster release, as they wanted to maintain the momentum of the first game. The sequel of Knights of the Old Republic as MMO was a significant departure from Bioware's traditional single-player RPG format. While some argue that it had a decent story, this marked a pivotal change in Bioware's direction. Mass Effect 3 was intended to be the glorious conclusion to the story. Nowadays, Many fondly remember the game and speak positively about the entire trilogy. However, if you recall back then, Mass Effect 3 completely tanked its ending. There was even an online petition for Bioware to change the ending. On paper, Mass Effect 3 was an ambitious attempt to conclude a story built over two games, but in reality, all the decisions felt like an illusion of choice. The ending remained the same, and most of the companions from previous parts were relegated to background roles. Additionally, Bioware continued to strip away RPG mechanics, making Mass Effect 3 feel more like an action game. While it was still well reviewed and a good game overall, I remember feeling very disappointed when I finished it. So I guess this is just like old times. Uh, hmm. Might be the last chance we get to say that. In September 2012, following the announcement of Dragon Age Inquisition, both Ray Muzika and Greg Zeschuk announced their retirement from the game industry. This marked the departure of all Bioware's founders from the company. With none of the original founders left, the next release was Dragon Age Inquisition. Despite winning Game of the Year and being considered a success, this was when I lost interest in Bioware's games. I remember I was very excited to play this game, as since Origins they had left many plot threads on the result. However, Inquisition was too different for me. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was just a single player MMO, a fetch quest boredom with a tedious and boring open world. The story was still good, but to get there you had to wait through a lot of boring side content. I'll be honest, I dropped that game and since then I haven't expected much from Bioware. And you know what happened after. Mass Effect Andromeda, probably the most disaster launch of a game that I can remember. Sorry, my face is tired from dealing with everything. My take is that Bioware, either independently or under pressure from EA, decided to pursue mass appeal. Instead of refining the formula they invented of dynamic companion relationships, choices and consequences, they kept stripping away complexity from their games in an attempt to make the games easier and simpler to digest. This gameplay simplification caused the studio to stagnate and lose their talent. They chased the trends of repetitive open world, fetch quests, paid DLCs, while continually releasing rushed and undercooked games. The further they moved away from their origins, the more they lost their founders as well as key creatives, writers and developers who contributed to the essence of the all good Bioware that we love and cherish. Let us part ways now. You go your way to your destiny and I go my way to mine. 
while Bioware has consistently delivered hit after hit since its foundation, Larian Studios has faced struggles from day one. And by struggles, I don't mean they were going through development hell or anything like that, no. I mean they were fighting for survival with every single game. Larian has faced bankruptcy numerous times throughout its history. Larian was founded in 1996 in Belgium by Sven Winke, just a year later than Bioware. Since the beginning, they were a small, ambitious studio driven by a desire to make a game that they would like to play. Their first project that marked the beginning of their journey was called Ragnarok Unless. It was supposed to be an open world game, and they managed to go from being no names to showing up at the European trade show, signing a contract with Atari, and receiving $50,000 check to start developing their first game. Shortly after signing the contract and starting development, Atari quit the PC market and Larian found themselves back to square one. But Larian didn't give up. They decided to repurpose Ragnarok's idea for their next game, which was called The Lady, The Mage, and The Knight. The publisher wanted a Diablo-like game and requested a complete overhaul of all assets. They also added an additional team of German developers to assist with the task, and Larian was happy to comply. They got 30 more developers from Germany assigned from the publisher, but midway through the development process, the publisher went bankrupt. Larian didn't have enough money to pay salaries, and they were one month away to close. The game got cancelled. Their next game was Divine Divinity, for which they signed a deal with the publisher CTV. It was a hack and slash Diablo-like game, but incorporated a heavy amount of traditional CRPG elements, such as branching conversation trees, non-combat skills, bartering, and assistance to track relationships with NPCs. They also placed significant emphasis on exploration, a feature that will become a hallmark of other games. The publisher decided to release the game too yearly, not allowing Larian to polish it properly as they would want to. The game suffered from a significant amount of bugs upon release. However, the game was well reviewed. In the IGN's review, they predicted Larian's future. And who knows, with Bioware's assets tied up in lightsabers and Black Isle Studios, working on a game that has no strategic pause mode, perhaps Larian will step forward to carry the CRPG banner in the near future. Despite the generally positive reviews, Larian almost went bankrupt again. They had to let go of most of their employees because they didn't sign a favorable contract with the publisher. Essentially, the publisher funded development but retained all the profits. Larian didn't receive any royalties. As a result, they had to downsize from 30 people to just 3 within a span of 5 months. The moral was low, but they didn't give up. To survive, Larian had to take work for hire, develop small games for casinos and educational games for clients to keep the studio afloat. They had to start almost from scratch again, this time with a bank loan and a loan from a Belgian broadcaster. They created Catnet Kick, a 3D game for children to create their own animations. With additional funding, they began working on Beyond Divinity. They consider it to be the worst game in the series, but this time they managed to secure a direct deal with distributors and avoid falling into another publisher trap. During this period, there was a sense of financial stability that allowed the studio to survive. Working on contracts for hire also helped them pay the bills and fund their next games. Larian acquired enough money to develop Divinity 2. They returned to CDV publisher to to secure additional funding. The development process was complex and Larian had gained a reputation for not being a stable place at work. They used to have a contract with the developers with a duration of only one week and many who used to work at that time, they used to tell that if they will go to a bank and try to get a loan, they will get rejected just because they work at Larian. The game had very ambitious mechanics such as the ability to transform your character into a dragon. Whose only aim was to destroy us all. When 2009 arrived, so did the financial crisis. Facing financial problems, the publisher decided to publish Larian's game without allowing them to finish it. Divinity 2 was a disaster. It released in a very poor state and it was the worst reviewed game by Larian. We've pretty much lost everything that we've built up financially over the last years. Half of my team is looking to go work for EA or Activision. We're not getting paid at all from the publisher. My wife doesn't want to talk with me anymore and she wants to move. I'm a physical wreck and doctors tell me that I have to take another job. So there we are, 2009. It wasn't really good. May the luck of the gods be with you both. This was when Larian decided once and for all to say goodbye to publishers and seek a different source of financing that wouldn't compromise the studio's timeline. And that's when early access and Kickstarter reshaped Larian into what they are now. Larian launched Kickstarter for Divinity Original Seat 1 in 2013, raising nearly $1 million over a goal of 400000 That same year, Team announced early access, allowing gamers to buy an unfinished game to play it early and support developers. Kickstarter and early access combined gave us what I afterwards realized was the most important thing. It gave 
gave us time to finalize the last phase of the creation of the game. The original budget was 3 million, but the cost of the game grew to 4.5 million, which meant another risk of bankruptcy. The studio put everything they had into it. Swen even put down a mortgage on his house. Everything they had went to the Divinity Original Sin 1. The high risks paid off, and Larry received great review rates, selling over a half million copies in the first year of sales. Then came another successful campaign for Divinity Original Sin 2, bigger in scale, with a larger production. They raised over 2 million on Kickstarter, sold over 2 million of copies, and proved that there is a demand for complex RPG in a time when CRPG in genre was considered to be dead. It was a significant turning point when Larian Studios, a studio with just 40 developers, was able to scale up a team to 400. I remain undaunted and as determined as ever to claim my rightful throne. Following the success of Divinity Original Sin 2, they were approached by Wizards of the Coast, the same company that once rejected them to make Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, Baldur's Gate, that's the crown jewel. We don't really want to do anything with it until we know the exact right partner in place and the exact right story to tell. Baldur's Gate 3 has proven to be a much more successful title than Divinity Original Sin 2. Despite being in nearly access since 2020 and only receiving its full release in 2023, Larian took their time to deliver the game as they wanted, refusing to compromise on quality. Just on Steam, in 2023, the game managed to generate over 650 million in revenue. I also believe that Larian was very strategic with Baldur's Gate 3. They released a game that featured dynamic party relationships, choices, and consequences. Help me kill these asses. The guild will sprinkle you with gold. At the time when high quality CRPGs of this caliber are pretty much non existent. In fact, it's arguable that we haven't seen a CRPG with this level of production since Dragon Age Originals in 2009. Larian effectively took what Bioware was once known for and improved upon it. After looking at both studios, it's clearly visible that they both always ran into development issues. However, what separates them is how they approach them. Bioware, a once upon a time studio formed by six people who were passionate about games, initially created video games that reflected their own love for the medium. They took risks and brought back to life a genre of RPGs that used to be considered dead. They had a clear vision of the games they wanted to create. However, they started to chase new trends by simplifying their games in hopes of appealing to a broader audience. After being acquired by EA, Bioware experienced a gradual departure of its founders and writers who played integral roles in shaping the games that we love. When looking at the current state of Bioware and trying to compare it to the times when they created Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, it's a completely different studio. Bioware appears to have lost its identity and rediscovering it will prove to be quite a challenge. Unfortunately, I don't think they will be able to recapture the lost magic with Dragon Age Dreadwolf. Larian, on the contrary, regardless of all the changes that they had to go through, Swen managed to preserve the studio's identity. He has been at the helm since day one and has upheld the studio's independence. While Larian faced numerous challenges, one of the most prominent issues was dealing with publishers. Fortunately, through new avenues such as crowdfunding, and early access, they were able to cut off traditional publishers and maintain their independence. They realized that by retaining control over when their games are released, their finances, and their creative process, they could deliver exceptional games. Their formula for success lies in making the games they want to make, complex RPGs that offer players the freedom to explore the world and tackle obstacles in creative ways that set their games apart from the others. With Baldur's Gate 3, Larian Studios stepped into Bioware's niche of an RPG that features dynamic companion relationships and a choice-driven narrative. Larian with Baldur's Gate 3 did something remarkable. It combined the best parts of Bioware's RPG formula and made it even better. We don't make decisions where we, take, where we think this could make us the most money. On the long run, building a community, building a player base, building games that are actually fun is going to make you the most money. That's it.